Welcome to episode 173 of This Week in Linux, recorded live on October 23rd, 2021. From the Destination Linux Network, I'm Michael Tunnell. If you're new to the show, this is the podcast that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take as a 20-year-plus Linux user. And this week's episode is just filled with all sorts of cool stuff, so let's jump right into your weekly source for Linux good news. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean and by Bitwarden. A first in the show this week, Valve is introducing something to help gamers find out what games will work well on the upcoming Steam Deck. This program is called Steam Deck Verified. So Valve has said that they are reviewing the entire Steam catalog of games, and from these reviews, they will be categorizing each game for its level of compatibility with the Steam Deck. Now, these ratings will be displayed in the Steam Store and in the gamer's uh, Steam library, and they have many different options for the categories listing for the badges based on their testing. So they have the verified, playable, unsupported, and unknown categories. So with verified, this is for games running great out of the box. Playable is for titles that work but need some tweaking to make work well. And also there's unsupported, which is obviously not functional on the Steam Deck. And then there's games that have not been checked yet, which is what the unknown category is for. So Valve has said that they're going to be doing the entire catalog, but that will take some time. So that's why there's the unknown section. Valve also has said that they are evaluating each game based on many factors such as input, display, seamlessness, and system support. So for input, we're talking about the title should have full controller support, use appropriate controller input icons, and also automatically bring up the on-screen keyboard when needed. And with the displays, this is, for example, like displaying of the default settings for the Steam Deck, which is the 1280 by 800 or 1280 by 720 for the default resolution of the Steam Deck. And also with the seamlessness, the title shouldn't display any compatibility warnings, and if there's a launcher, it should be navigatable with the controller. And in terms of the system support, this is related to uh, Proton and also native support. So if it's running through Proton, the game and all its middleware should be supported by Proton itself, such as anti-cheat support and that kind of thing. They also have a page that they made for the Steam Deck compatibility review process. And there's a lot of stuff listed on here that gives you the much more details about this. So I'll have that linked in the show notes if you want to check it out. But one of the things that they talk about it is the Proton requirements. So it's not required to use Proton. However, if you if your game is doesn't have native Linux builds, it will be run through Proton on the Steam Deck, so they do have requirements specifically for that. And they do state that if you don't have a native build, that it will just run through Proton. So the Proton compatibility requirements is very important. And uh, so for those who don't know, Proton is a compatibility layer for Windows to run Windows games. And it's a set of tools that will automatically take a current Windows executable and game data and run them through uh, this, the, the Proton compatibility layer onto the Steam Deck's Linux-based OS. So Proton is a work in progress still, though, and it's, 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 it's possible that the game doesn't necessarily work, and that's why they have this, st- this statement in the compatibility notes, which is very important. But they also talk about whether or not a developer can request to have their game removed from the listings of the Steam Deck verification system. And the Valve says that the Steam Deck is an extension of Steam onto a new portable PC form factor, and so customers both expect and have access to the same store and library that they would own on any other PC, which means they're not going to allow developers to not have the badge. So there will either be a badge saying it's verified or badges saying that it's not supported and all this other kind of thing, which will give incentive for the developers to add support at least to a playable state, if not for a fully verified state, which is good because it gives incentive for not only just having this game supported through Proton or whatever, but it also gives a path for you know developers who port games to Linux to be able to convince uh, you know game developers and publishers to make the make work happen. I mean, do some work on it to make it work on the Steam Deck. So. For example, Ethan Lee posted on Twitter that he says, Finally, my time has come. If you're interested in making your game verified for deck and want to avoid the nasty proton but unsupported paragraph, give me an email. This is interesting because for a little while back, there was some issues about uh, Ethan Lee feeling that the Steam Deck and the proton approach is going to kind of lower the amount of development for Linux native ports or Linux native games in general. And there, and it doesn't make sense that that's a possibility, but this allows this to be less of an issue because they do talk about native Linux builds or 
Proton support in their compatibility documentation. So having that option where it is Proton, but also not necessarily supported is very important in terms of incentive to get people to hire someone to help them make it work on Proton or to help make it work as a native game, which is awesome. We also got word from Valve that they have hired new people to do testing for the various games through the Steam Deck. Uh, there was a report from Rock Paper Shotgun. That's a fun name, by the way. Valve says they have hired an additional group of testers specifically for Steam Deck compatibility and will continue to hire new staff to support this group. They will say it will take some time to perform a, a full Steam catalog check, but they are hiring people to do so, and that is great news. Now, they didn't really mention how you could sign up to be one of those people, but they did say that they are hiring people or have hired people and do plan to at some point. So maybe at some point they'll open it to more people, but who knows? If you'd like to learn more about this new Steam Deck verified program, I'll have links in the show notes below. Up next in the show is everybody's favorite, legal news. So for legal news this week, SFC has decided to sue a major TV vendor, Vizio, for abusing the GPL. The SFC is the Software Freedom Conservancy, and it is a nonprofit organization that promotes open source software and defends the GPL or the general public license. So the reason for this lawsuit is stated to be because Vizio's SmartCast OS is based on Linux. Linux source code is protected under the GPL version 2, and also, in addition to the kernel, there's other code that are using GPL or LGPL inside of SmartCast, including U-Boot, Bash, Gawk, Tar, GLibc, FFmpeg, and others. And in short, basically, Vizio is using the code without permission because it requires you to, prov to provide source code of your own, and they have not been doing that. So the company was first informed that it had violated the GPL v2 for not releasing SmartCast OS uh, source code by the SFC in August of 2018. After over a year of what they described as diplomatic attempts to work with the company, the Conservancy declared that not only was the company Vizio still refusing to comply, but it had stopped responding to inquiries altogether as of January 2020. Before, there's been many cases like this that have been happening. You know, people have sued over the GPL for many years, I can, you, at least going back to 2007, maybe more than that. Uh, but before these cases were typically defended on the rights of the developers, ha having access to the code if you're taking, uh, you know, using their code for your own purposes. Now, this was different because the SFC is taking a new approach in this lawsuit. The new focus is on the consumer side as the purchase purchaser of the product. Now, this approach makes it the first legal case that focuses on the rights of the individual consumer as a third-party GPL beneficiary, which is really interesting because, well, why does this distinction make, you know, why is it important? Well, it's all about the right to repair. So to quote the SF SFC, they say that the right to repair software is essential for everyone, even if you don't know how to make the repairs yourself. Once upon a time, we had lots of local vendors that could repair and fix TVs when they broke. And that's because TVs were once analog hardware devices that could be taken apart and understood merely by inspection from someone with sufficient knowledge. TVs today are simply a little computer attached to a large display. As such, the most important part that needs repairs is usually when the software malfunctions. It has bugs or otherwise needs upgrades and changes. The GPL was designed specifically to assure such fixes could be done and that consumers could hire someone if they couldn't do it themselves, but be able to make repairs and changes. Now, it's important to note that this lawsuit is not seeking any monetary damages. It is only asking that Vizio give access to the technical information that the copyleft licenses require, which I think is a very important key difference between a lot of you know lawsuits that you would typically hear about. And uh, Karen Sandler, the SFC's executive director, made a great point about how this relates to right to repair. And I quote, the global supply chain shortages that have affected everything from cars to consumer electronics underscore one of the reasons why it is important to be able to repair products we already own. Even without supply chain challenges, the forced obsolescence of devices like TVs isn't the best interest of the consumer or even the planet. This is another aspect of what we mean by ethical technology. Throwing away a TV because its software is no longer supported by its manufacturer is not only wasteful, it has dire environmental consequences. Now, we've talked about right to repair on this show many times. We've talked about it on the Destination Linux podcast as well many times. Right to repair is incredibly important, especially these days where companies are doing their best to lock everything down. 
And I think it will be very interesting to see what happens with this new approach that the FC is, SFC is taking for this lawsuit. And I wish them the best because any time where we have to deal with not being able to repair our own devices is not a good time. So if you'd like to learn more about this particular lawsuit or the SFC in general, I'll have links in the show notes. From one hardware-related topic to another hardware-related topic, let's talk about the Raspberry Pi. Now, the Raspberry Pi is awesome, and it's been around for many, many years, since 2012, actually. But we do have some unfortunate news to give you. The Raspberry Pi has announced a price increase because of the supply chain problems that the, well, world has been ex uh, experiencing lately. So there, this is the first ever price increase for the Raspberry Pi product in general. Now, the 2 gigabyte configuration of the Raspberry Pi 4 and the Raspberry Pi Zero in particular have been hit hard by these shortages. And back in February 2020, the price of the 2 gigabyte Pi 4 was cut from the $45 to the $35. And now that's going back up to $45. So the 2 gigabyte Pi 4 is now going to be $45 again. However, in order to still give an option for the $35 uh, Pi, they're bringing back the one gigabyte Pi 4. So if you still want need to, you know, base it, something on the $35 price point, you can do so with the one gigabyte Pi 4. Uh, but according to the Raspberry Pi founder, Eben Upton says that these changes in pricing are not here to stay. We see early signs that the supply chain situation is starting to ease as global supply chain issues moderate. We'll keep revisiting this issue and want to get the pricing back to where it was as fast as we can. Now, the Raspberry Pi is an awesome piece of, of hardware. It is a fantastic ecosystem where you can do all sorts of stuff, whether you want to do applications or just build out your own small uh, for whatever embedded device you want. And I've, I've helped people deploy Raspberry Pis and all sorts of things, whether it's a, you know, a menu for a restaurant or just displaying signs or any kinds of things. There's, it's such a very versatile, flexible platform. It is awesome. And it's unfortunate that they have to increase the price. But at the same time, it's cool that they brought back another option for those who still need that $35 price point. And also the price point of a an extra $10 isn't catastrophic. So it's, you know, and it doesn't seem to be affecting the other options. It's just a two gigabyte Pi 4 that I could see. So if you wanted to get the four gigabyte or the eight gigabyte, it should still be the same price as it was. So there's that. If you'd like to learn more, I'll have links in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Now is the perfect time to dive into the DigitalOcean. Their new app platform service helps you build modern cloud-native apps with for way less money. With the app platform, you can build and deploy, as well as scale your apps and static websites faster and easier than ever using a simple, intuitive interface. You simply point the app platform to your GitHub or GitLab repository and let it do all of the heavy lifting. Whether you're using Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, static sites, Docker, or container images, all of these work with the app platform. And by running the app platform on their own infrastructure, DigitalOcean keeps your cost significantly lower than with other products. Plus, it's built on top of DigitalOcean's Kubernetes, providing a smoother migration path so you can take more control of your infrastructure setup. As a listener of the This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started building your world-changing app on the app platform for free. Actually, it gets better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 free credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with a $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's app platform. I'm going to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Next in the show, let's talk about some more gaming stuff with the RPCS3 project has reached an awesome milestone stating that their compatibility list shows it has hit the ability to boot all known games for the PS3. That's right. For those unfamiliar, the RPC S3 is a free and open source cross-platform PlayStation 3 emulator. So the RPC S3 team posted on Twitter, we're delighted to announce that RPC S3 now has a total of zero games in the nothing status. This means that all known games and applications at least boot on the emulator, with no ongoing regressions that prevent games from booting. We look forward to emptying out the loadable category too. This doesn't mean that all games work great, obviously. Taking a look at their compatibility list, there are a lot of games that you can do. Like, for example, there's about... Uh, there's a few different categories, but there's over 2,000 that are playable, but there's still a large amount of work that needs to be the rest of the games to be working. So there's there's some that are playable, some that are loadable, 
but have issues and glitches and that kind of thing. So you can technically play some of them even though they have glitches, and other ones work great. And also recently, the RP the RPCS3, that just rolls right off the tongue, uh, team also published a video going over some graphical improvements they've made to various games. The differences in some of these games are night and day, and in some cases, like, I mean that literally, as in there's too much brightness, or you know, artifacts in that sense, but also it's just in the way that they make the games better to use. So some of them were runnable, but not really playable due to some bugs. Uh, and now they're not only playable, but they look and run great based on their video demonstration of the different changes, which is just awesome. So if you want to try out a free and open source PlayStation 3 emulator, then check out RPCS3 with links in the show notes. Last week, we talked about the latest release of Ubuntu 21.10, but we only talked about the Ubuntu proper, meaning the official Ubuntu made by Canonical. We only had a look at that version because there was just so much content on last week's episode. Also true about this week's episode, but I wanted to fit in the flavors this week. So we're going to have a quick look at some of the various flavors because for many people, including myself... The flavors are more interesting at this point than the main Ubuntu release. So let's talk about what the flavors are. For those who are not familiar, there's Lubuntu, Kubuntu, Zubuntu, Ubuntu Studio, Ubuntu Budgie, Ubuntu Chillin, and Ubuntu Mate. And there's actually a lot of interesting stuff that's happened on all of them, but we're going to highlight a few instead of them all, because there's quite a few. There's there's a lot of them. (laughs) So let's first talk about Lubuntu. So Lubuntu's latest version of 21.10 has LXQt 0.17 desktop environment. This is the latest version of LXQt, which I'm pretty sure was released in April of this year. I could be wrong about the exact time. I'm going to take a guess if I remember, because I did talk about it on this show. So I think it was April 6th of this year. I might be wrong about that, but I'm going to have to check after I've done the show to see if I was right. But Moving on, Lubuntu also has Discover Software Center 5.22.5, which is really interesting for those who don't know, Discover is a software center for the KDE Plasma and the KDE stack, and having it in Lubuntu is also really cool because it allows the Lubuntu project to not have to duplicate effort and still get a nice software center, which is great. Also, Lubuntu is looking really slick these days. If you go back a few years, uh, Lubuntu shipped with LXDE, and back then it was often praised for its lightweight status, but not often for the look and feel. And this is in part to uh, the LXQt coming about, making it you know in very much improvements to the overall look. But also, Lubuntu has made some of their own enhancements to improve the overall feel of the desktop, and I think they deserve a bit of recognition for that, which is why I wanted to talk about it, because Lubuntu is not known for being a polished desktop. It's mostly known for the lightweight aspect, but it's now pretty much both of those. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Also, Kubuntu has the latest version of KDE Plasma 522. Now, they didn't have 523 because that came out basically around the same time, And there's a freeze point where the development can't get through. Uh, But you can get the latest version of 5.23 via a Backports PPA if you would like to do that. And this also comes with KDE Gear 21.08. Now, if you don't know what KDE Gear is, this is basically the name of the application suite for KDE. uh, KDE Apps makes more sense, but it's called KDE Gear. There you go. So that has the latest version of 21.08. Also, Zubuntu has many bug fixes and improvements, as well as significant work on the Thunar file manager and keyboard shortcut support. With Ubuntu Budgie, you got Budgie 10.5.3. There are many big improvements to the tiling functionality in Ubuntu Budgie, which is called the Window Shuffler. I like this good name, by the way, Window Shuffler. Such as uh, auto-arranging windows across monitors and workspaces, which is really nice. Also, it now has an applet for Window Shuffler to do uh, basically being able to manage your windows via mouse clicks from the Budgie panel, which is pretty cool. And then we get the last one I want to talk about with Ubuntu Mate. And this is based on the Mate Desktop 1.26.0. This is the biggest significant difference between uh, the latest version of Ubuntu Mate and the previous version. And there's a lot of significant effort that was invested into uh, Mate Desktop 1.26 for fixing bugs, optimizing, optimizing performance, and and also uh, fixing a lot of memory leaks. So if you are an Ubuntu Mate user, definitely worth the upgrade. Uh, basically, all of these are worth the upgrade because there's a lot of good stuff in here. And if you want to learn more about it, I'll have links in the show notes. But I wanted to cover something I thought was interesting. Lubuntu and Kubuntu have both decided to ship the Firefox 
uh, Deb versions and not the Snap version, like is in the Ubuntu proper. Uh, and this is going to be interesting moving forward because I think that option is likely going away in the 22.04 LTS edition of Ubuntu. So we'll still have to wait and see what the decision is there. But they didn't ship the Snap like others did. So I'm very curious to see what goes on with those particular distro, uh, flavors of the distro because I think that uh, I personally agree that I'm not a fan of the Snap approach because Snap, it has issues still. I mean, I'm I'm... I'm hopeful that the Snaps format will improve later on, but for now, uh, you know, I think it was a little too early to do this switch, but there you go. If you'd like to learn more, you can check out the uh, article that was posted on the, on the front page Linux website or frontpagelinux.com. I have links in the show notes below. Real quick edit to the show. I was wrong. It's not April 6th. It was April 16th. However, I still get a little bit of credit, like a little bit for having the number six in my head correctly. I'm going to go with that and just like, anyway, moving on. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about some enterprise Linux stuff. And enterprise Linux has been changing so much and has been so interesting for the past year because of the announcement that Red Hat did with CentOS and CentOS Stream and that sort of stuff. And I mention this pretty much every time we talk about it because it is so ridiculously weird how the enterprise has moved so much so fast so often as well because of like you go back a couple years you hardly ever talked about enterprise because things hardly ever changed so this is just really cool and especially with this latest announcement from alma linux because they have announced a cool new project called elevate capital e capital l for enterprise linux Elevate. So Elevate enables migration between major versions of rail derivatives. Essentially, you can go from CentOS 7.x to, well, any 8.x version of your choice. And up until now, rail clones didn't have the ability to do this. So, well, rail itself did. It's always offered a way to do an upgrade, having an upgrade assistant. And they also had a tool called Convert to Rail, being able to go from CentOS to rail really easily. Uh, but what's really cool about this is that you know, well, it's for a lot of reasons, not just because, you know, this is a thing that didn't happen before, before the rail clones, but it's, it's because uh, it offers cross upgrading. Now, what does that mean? So what it does is that it allows you to go from CentOS 7 to Alma Linux 8. So you don't have to go from CentOS to CentOS or CentOS to rail. You can go to CentOS 7 to Alma Linux 8 or even Rocky Linux or Oracle Linux if you want to, for some reason. Now, this is also an in-place upgrade, which is very, very important for many users because of all your data applications and settings will be kept through the upgrade. Plus, it's also all open source and the community can improve it if they want to do that, which is another reason why I think Alma Linux is a great project because this shows that Alma Linux is trying to solve pain points for the community of Rail users that don't want to use Rail directly. And yet another reason why I continue to be impressed by what the folks at Alma Linux are doing because they keep solving issues that have been, you know, kind of a thing for the derivatives of Rail for many, many years. Now, Elevate combines Red Hat's Leap framework with a community-created library and service called the Package Evolution Service, or PES, which allows you to download, customize, and even submit new data sets for packages. So you could think of this new Package Evolution Service of Elevate as a PES dispenser. Yep, exactly. You're welcome. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can find links in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is an awesome piece of software. It is a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do it? Well, Bitwarden provides you various amounts of tools to be able to store your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate passwords so you don't have to worry about that part, and even automatically fill in passwords on login forms so you don't do that either. And this is also fantastic because it allows you to do this stuff off acro across many different types of devices, such as your web browser extension or mobile applications or desktop application or even on the command line. Plus, Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your devices so you know you're the only person with access to your data. So no matter what device you t type of device you use, all that encryption and decryption is happening on your device specifically, which means that you don't have to worry about the data going across the network because it is all just a garbled gibberish at that point. <laughs> 
So you have to be able to have your devices and be able to decrypt it yourself, which is one of the reasons why I think Bitwarden is awesome. And another reason is because they are focused on open source and also they do self, they do uh, third party audits, which is just fantastic because the third party audits are really cool because not only do they do those, they also take all the results and publish it on their blog to let you know what happened in the audits, which is just really cool and it shows how they're transparent about their information. And you can get started by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN. And did I mention you can get started for free? Well, you can, but I also think you want to check out their premium account because it starts at less than a dollar per month. That's right. For less than a dollar per month, you can get one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and so much more. So make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to check out their awesome service. And if you have more than one person that needs an account, you could, like a friends or family account or a business account, you can set it up for as many, as many people as you want and be able to share passwords back and forth through organizational faults or, or family vaults or that kind of thing. And it just makes it much easier to get people started. I've done that with my friends and family. And also we do it through the Destination Linux Network. It makes it easier to pass passwords if we need to. And it's just, Bitwarden is just fantastic. So check it out, bitwarden.com slash DLN. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is the latest release of MX Linux 21. This is a Debian-based distribution, and in this latest release has it updated to Debian 11 Bullseye Base. It has a new installer partition selection and management area, including some LVM support, as well as new UE, UEFI live system boot menus. The UEFI live users can now select your live boot options from a boot menu and sub menus rather than using like previous console menus. Uh, like for example, if you want to select persistence and that kind of thing, and also a new uh, rollback boot option has been added to this latest release. And for those who are not familiar, MX Linux, like I said, is a Debian based distribution and it has three editions. It has XFCE, KDE Plasma, and also a new one called Fluxbox. And this latest release of MX Linux 21 has XFCE 4.16, KDE Plasma 5.20, and Fluxbox 1.3.7. Now, you might have noticed if you're a KDE Plasma person or if you watched the latest couple of episodes that the latest version is, is 5.23 and not 5.20. So why does the MX Linux latest version have 5.20? Well, that's because Debian's uh, uh, update speed is not the best when it comes to the KDE stack. So it will likely be 5.20 for a while. And if that's something that you're fine with, then by all means, check out MX Linux because they do put a lot of effort into that addition in addition to the other options as well in the XFC XFCE and Fluxbox. So if you are wanting to get a Debian-based plasma, uh, but you don't want to use an Ubuntu-based distribution, you could consider this. But keep in mind, you're not going to get the latest and greatest plasma because Debian doesn't do that. Moving on. So this latest release of MX Linux 21 has a, uh, a new uh, MX Tor update. So this new uh, MX Linux release also introduces this app called MX Tor, which provides new users with a brief overview of each desktop environment when you decide to, inst whichever one you install, it gives you a, a tour showing how it works and kind of just getting you used to the, the workflow of everything which is really cool. And I think every distribution should do something like this, maybe not in this specific method, but in some way have a, a tour or a welcome app or something else that just kind of walks people through the first usage of it and just get used to how the system works. Because why not? Sounds like a great idea to me. And also this latest version has a new default theming for uh, all of the different editions, as well as having dark variants of this. And it's called MX Comfort which is an interesting name because it's supposed to be comforting. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, And also this latest release of MX Linux has updated um, support for Realtek Wi-Fi, as well as having the Mesa Vulkan drivers installed by default, which is nice. And if you'd like to learn more about MX Linux 21, I will have links in the show notes. Up next in the show is the latest release of Red Core Linux 2102 has been released. So what is Red Core Linux? Red Core Linux is a distribution based on Gentoo Linux, and it uses some stuff from the stable Gentoo and also from the testing Gentoo. And it aims to be a very quick way to install a pure Gentoo Linux system without spending hours or days compiling, compiling source code, because you typically would need to do that. It takes a while to install Gentoo. 
uh, or, you know, reading documentation and all that sort of stuff to get used to doing all that takes a while as well. So Gen 2 is a very powerful distribution, but it does take some setup time, whereas Red Core Linux is making it possible to get Gen 2 without having to do all of that stuff. So it comes with pre-built binary packages in a repository that receives continuous updates, basically like a rolling release. And it comes with, by default, KDE Plasma, which is great. And in this particular ver version, they have KDE Plasma 5.22.5 with KDE Gear 21.08.1, which again, KDE Gear refers to the application suite. Now, Red Core Linux has been around for almost five years, and actually next month they're going to be celebrating five years, so quick happy uh, happy birthday uh, in advance, I guess. Uh, but what's new in this latest release is that they have uh, resynced with Gentoo's testing tree as of October uh, 1st of this year. They're using the Linux kernel 5.14.10 as the default, but you can also use the LTS uh, kernels for 5.10 or 5.4. Uh, they have X Wayland now as a standalone package, uh, which basically is re reference to other distributors who are, who've done that as well because of the changes that are happening with Xorg and X Wayland. Uh, also, they have replaced Firefox with, as a default web browser with Chromium. And they've also replaced Thunderbird as a default mail client with MailSpring. Now, that's really interesting. Uh, MailSpring is an electron-based application, and it is one of the email clients that I prefer to use because it is very nice. And if you've never heard of it, check it out. Moving on. So they've also improved the NVIDIA driver support, making it possible for Prime offloading working out of the box now via the NVIDIA-Prime package. And while this is not necessarily new, I think it's worth noting because uh, it's there's not a lot of distributions that do this, but there's more and more happening. Where the last version of Redcore, they announced that Flatpak is there by default, which is, again, still in this version. And I think that more distributions should consider that because... Well, Flatpak's awesome. So just wanted to put that out there. If you'd like to learn more about Red Core Linux or get a download for version 2102, you'll find links in the show notes. Up next in the show, let's talk about GIMP 2.99.8, which is the latest release is the development version of GIMP which is working towards GIMP 3.0. It has, and this has been released this week. And I'm very much looking forward to 3.0 because there's a lot of cool stuff coming. But this latest release of the development version has some cool stuff as well, such as you can now use the clone type tools on multiple layers at the same time, which is very cool. Also, Selection Cube has been fixed on Wayland. Uh, there's a wider coverage of input devices thanks to implementing Windows Ink support, as well as improvements for support of various file formats like JPEG XL, PSD, PSB, and more. For those who don't know, PSD means Photoshop document, so that's very important to have support for that. And also, uh, there's improvements to plugin development, uh, memory leak fixes, and much more. So, for those who are not familiar with GIMP, GIMP, or the GNU Image Manipulation Program, has a long history of development, dating back to January 1996. Now, it has been around for a very long time, but it also hasn't had a lot of quick development. It's been around for a while, but it also is slow to make releases. For example, the current production version of GIMP is 2.10, which first came out in April 2010, so... There's a big difference between the current version of the uh, production thing and what's meant to be the next production thing. But uh, in a blog post shared on GIMP.org website in July, discussing the difficulty caused by contributors who leave the project, and in they invited users to contribute to funding some of the key maintainers for Gaggle and stuff like that, which is very important. So if you are interested in participating and help funding the GIMP project, please do so because it is a very important project in terms of, you know, open source and just longevity of this kind of software. So if you do want to do that, please do. But you see, the development is slow because many developers have left the project over the years. And I think it's kind of held back due to this developer turnover issue. And according to the latest release announcement for 2.99.8, they say there's some other issues such as taking care of technology changes. For example, Wayland on Linux or Mac OS in particular these days is also taking quite a toll on our development efficiency as we spend a lot of time fixing things which just get broken because the underlying system changes. Uh, end quote. Now, this is important because it is, it is definitely necessary to get funding for the existing developers and also get new developers. But I think there is a really big underlying barrier that stops the development happening. 
And I mean by getting new people involved in the project and that sort of stuff. And that is the name of GIMP. So I think GIMP 3.0 would be a wonderful opportunity to change the name of the project. And I know some people are like, ugh, not this again. But hear me out, okay? This is not some cancel culture thing about politically correctness or whatever. This needs to be done to actually solve the developer drain problem. And the reason why is because, well, GIMP has a problem for a couple of reasons. As a name, I mean. So the number one reason that you probably are aware of is the uh, Pulp Fiction reference. So uh, that's problematic. But arguably more problematic is the number two reason, which is because it's an, a word that is an insult to people with disabilities. So these it's not the greatest of names. Now, most of the time, the detractors for this, when I mention it, will typically say something like, it's an acronym. It's not intended to be offensive. Just get over it. Well, here's the problem with that. It is intended to be offensive. The name GIMP was originally chosen by the founders of a, for, as a reference for the Pulp Fiction version. The Pulp Fiction version, they said so themselves, is the reason they chose that name. So perhaps they weren't aware of the other reason it's offensive, but they did choose that because they thought it would be funny. And it's not really funny. It's, it's, it holds the project back, in my opinion. So why does this matter anyway, and why do I care so much? Well, the answer to both of these are essentially the same thing. I want to promote the project, and I want the project to not just succeed, I want it to thrive. And this name is a huge barrier for that to happen. I mean, you might consider this a nothing burger, but I genuinely believe that the reason why GIMP has been around for almost 26 years, and it is yet, it is still struggling to convince developers to work on it, and struggling to convince companies or institutions to promote it, is in fact how unprofessional the name is. Because they don't want to promote that they're working on it. They don't want to promote that, that it's a part of their resume. I personally took it off my resume a long time ago because of this issue. I would call it the GNU imp or something. And it was just, no, no. You know what? I guess I'll just leave the topic here. Uh, as a professional in this space and an advocate for open source, I've followed the GIMP project for over 20 years. So I have a lot more to say about this topic. A lot more. If you want me to do so, I can do that in a video or, you know, go more in depth about the history of it and that kind of thing if you would like to know more. Uh, but we'll just leave it there. You may still think this complaint is dumb or whatever, and it may not seem like a big deal, but it is. And I can tell you about many instances where businesses refuse to implement it or educational institutions refuse to teach it solely because of the name. And it's just unfortunate. And I really hope... I know it's kind of like I've talked about it on a couple times on the show, and this is sort of a plea to the project. You just change the name. Even if you change the word program to software and make it gems or whatever, that's still going to solve the problem. And you, can, you, you don't have to worry about losing SEO or whatever. You can just redirect the domains and that sort of stuff. Just think about it. If you'd like to learn more and check out the latest version of GIMP, I'll have links in the show notes. Up next in the show, let's talk about some Humble Bundles because you can get a lot of cool stuff in these latest bundles. There is a lot of DevOps-related stuff for books and uh, coding and that kind of thing, so let's get you started. There's uh, All of the bu current bundles, you'll find links in the show notes, and also keep in mind, these are affiliate links, so if you do want to pr uh, purchase one of these bundles, please use the links below because it will help this channel and this show, and I'd very much appreciate that. So there you go. If you do decide to get one of them, please use one of those links. Now, Humble Bundles uh, has, there's a lot of them I want to talk about. First, let's start with the books. So they have the Infrastructure and Ops by O'Reilly. You can get uh, Learning Helm, uh, Kubernetes Operators, Kubernetes Best Practices, Distributed Tracing and Practice, Distributed Systems with Node.js, and a lot more. In total, there's 15 books in this bundle. Then there's the Ultimate DevOps Bundle by Packet. You get uh, DevOps Paradox. Uh, mastering Kubernetes, Azure DevOps Explained, Learn Kubernetes Securities, and and more, and many more. Actually, twenty five books in this bundle. Then there's the Coding and Hardware by Make, which is basically like you know Make Magazine that kind of thing. So you get uh, Geometry, uh, Fusion three hundred and sixty for makers, uh, getting started with three D printing, and so much more. There's twenty nine books in that one. And in there's the next one is the AI and machine learning toolkit bundle, which gets you access to introduction to semi uh, supervised learning, uh, in introduction to graph neural networks, visual ob object recognition, and many more. 
24 bucks in that one. And the next one is a software bundle for uh, JavaScript learning. So if you want to learn JavaScript or web development, this is a bundle to check out. It has 14 items in this and all are uh, declared as compatible with Linux. So you might want to check that out. Uh, and also next, we want to talk about the games bundle because there's a lot of games bundle, but I want to talk about one specifically because it's awesome. And that is the Fighting Juggernauts bundle. Inside of this bundle, you get uh, Mortal Kombat XL, Soul Calibur 6, Injustice 2 Legendary Edition, Killer Instinct, and if for some reason you want to t attack Goldar from Power Rangers, you can get Power Rangers Battle for the Grid inside of this bundle. And uh, I checked it. Most of these games have support for Proton. Uh, not perfectly. You might have to do some tweaks and that kind of thing. But there you go. If you're interested in checking out any of these uh, bundles, I'll have links in the show notes. And reminder, it is affiliate links. So I would very much appreciate it if you were to use those when you do decide to get one. So links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the show and the channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via Patreon, sponsors, and others. You can learn more by becoming a patron and go to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. And if you do become a patron, you can join me during the live stream in the recording stadium to discuss stuff between topics and to just hang out every week after the show and also before the show in the new patron-only pre-show event that we do right before every, every episode of This Week in Linux. You can also support the show by checking out the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt, which is a shirt I designed to convey the message that whether or not you know Linux is there, it probably is. That's why it has tux blended into the background of the shirt. Also, you can check out the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm wearing right now. And you can get both of these by going to dealinstore.com. Plus, while you're there, you can check out all the other great stuff like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and many more by going to dealinstore.com. And if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the rest of the stuff on Destination Linux Network, such as Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts, because I'm a host of those shows as well. And there's also many more things on the show, like on the network, like GameSphere, uh, DLN Extend, Pseudo Show, just a lot of great content. So check it out, destinationlinux.network. And just a reminder, this show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1700 UTC. Well, until the week after next because next week it'll be 1700 but the week after that will be 1800 UTC but you know, whatever See, 1 p.m. US Eastern is the time so if you want to get a you know use a time zone converter that's the best way to do it reference that instead of UTC but I say it anyway just in case but it will change in a, a little over a week so keep that in mind anyway we do the show live every Saturday so you can join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each and every week by going to dealinlive.com Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanell with the Destination Linux Network, and I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux good news. <laughs>